Hurricane Sandy crashing on shore. Winds now at 90 miles per hour, and this storm is so big. Brazil's drought in the last 80 years is showing no signs of ending. It's a big one. Catastrophic, epic, disastrous. Words used by city leaders to describe what's happening in Houston. More than 13,000 firefighters are battling 19 major fires across the entire state, including what has already become the largest in California's history, the Mendocino Complex fire. At worldwide surface temperatures last month were the highest ever recorded for the month of June, a finding consistent with global heating caused by human activity. Climate fuel disasters are radically transforming the world we live in. With the increasing amount of deaths, displacements, and economic damages acting as a wake-up call for many. The severe storms, wildfires, inland floods, crop freezes, droughts, and tropical cyclones have touched nearly everyone around the world. And yet news coverage routinely underplays the central drama of these disasters. More often than not, it's the people living in the affected communities that, despite all the obstacles, rise to the occasion to save lives, reduce suffering, and form a community of care. It's what the author Rebecca Solnit describes as disaster collectivism, the sense of immersion in the moment and solidarity with others, caused by the rupture in everyday life, an emotion graver than happiness, but deeply positive. And the reimagining of what's possible doesn't stop after the initial recovery is over. Instead, it continues as communities regenerate, often increasing their equity, resilience, and capacity for joy. This is The Response, a podcast and documentary series exploring the remarkable communities that arise in the aftermath of disasters. Please join us as we revisit the people of Puerto Rico a little less than a year after Hurricane Maria slammed into the islands. Maria is on track to pass directly over St. Croix in the Virgin Islands overnight and then slam into Puerto Rico by early tomorrow morning. Mi nombre es Judith Rodríguez. Bueno, mi experiencia no fue nada agradable, por cierto, estaba durmiendo. Oigo el pito ese que, que yo le decía el pito de, 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 lo, de lo más feo que he vivido en mi vida, un pito que no se apagaba nunca. Yo lo encontré, bueno, fue interminable porque casi dos días. Pero donde yo estaba, la casa estaba en muy buenas condiciones, por lo menos yo creí. Y apenas desperté a las dos y media de la mañana, ya el susto lo pasé. El primer susto fue que la puerta de atrás salió volando. Una puerta, una puerta de metal que existía en la cocina, existía en la cocina. Salió volando, todavía la están buscando. When Hurricane Maria slammed into Puerto Rico on September 20th, 2017, the mountain town of Calle, where Judith Rodriguez lives, was, like much of the island, plunged into darkness for months. As winds reaching 175 miles per hour destroyed power lines and tore roofs off of houses. The result was the second longest blackout on record and what many consider to be the worst natural disaster to ever hit the United States or its colonies. No electricity meant that people had no way of doing some of what we considered to be some of the most basic of things, like cooking food. And not just in the immediate aftermath of the hurricane, but sometimes for months. This was true in towns all over the island, and it was a big problem. In the weeks after Maria hit, Judith had heard of an interesting place that had popped up a kind of community kitchen in the neighboring town of Kawas. They were cooking food for people, and they needed help. She wanted to do something to pitch in. She didn't have much, but she decided to go up anyways. Simplemente que vine porque yo me interesaba porque tenía en mi casa muchos trastes. Y yo dije, caramba, yo están cocinando para muchas personas. Que menos que yo le done de mis trastes que están ahí tirados en una esquina de mi casa que no puedo hacer nada con ellos en ese momento. Yo dije, caramba, and in what way, since this project is so beautiful, of people cooperating with other people. Now, the people. Judith wasn't the only one who had thought to help. In the weeks after Maria, something sort of remarkable had happened. The community kitchen had taken on a whole new life, and what started perhaps as just a few plates and volunteer cooks had grown into a fully-fledged community center. 
and in just a matter of months, it grew into an island-wide network of mutual aid centers, which, as we'll see, is quickly turning into a movement to transform Puerto Rico, one person at a time. In the aftermath of the storm, there were as many as 11 of these centers all over the islands, which were first inspired by the model developed in Kawas. While they all provided food, each center has taken a unique approach to meeting the needs of their communities. We'll explore what developed at four of these locations, and we'll start back in Kawas. In addition to providing food, their center began hosting weekly acupuncture clinics to help address some of the personal and collective trauma felt throughout the community after the hurricane. Yo pensaba que te dan un puñazo y te dicen cualquier cosa y te enseñan a respirar y eso era todo, pero no. Esto es mucho más que eso, es como cómo se llama? Yo diría que es una especie de estilo de vida, aprendes a vivir más más relax, a hacer las cosas con más calma, a ser más juicioso. Cooperando con otro porque somos una comunidad. Querramos o no, los seres humanos somos una comunidad. Olvídese estemos en la China, en Puerto Rico, en Japón, donde sea. Somos una comunidad, queremos uno, tenemos que darnos las manos. Y aquí en Puerto Rico, yo le digo el, el barco, si se hunde, nos hundimos todos. No me hundo yo solita, nos hundimos todos. A year later, the acupuncture clinics were still going on. My name is Giovanni Roberto. I'm part of the organizing team here in the Mutual Aid Center of Caguas. Today we have in the weekly acupuncture clinic, we work with stress and post-traumatic syndrome, addictions, and other health issues. Puerto Rico's healthcare situation wasn't great before Maria, and the hurricane only made things worse. Many hospitals were left without electricity for months after the storm, and primary care became a luxury that few had access to. According to research published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the death toll, now estimated to be in the thousands, was primarily caused by interruptions in medical care. And a less visible effect of the hurricane was the trauma it inflicted on the Puerto Rican psyche. Suicide prevention hotlines were getting up to five, even 600 calls a day after the storm. And physicians were reporting unprecedented numbers of mental health hospitalizations. Acupuncture clinics, like the one here at the Mutual Aid Center in Kawas, made a big difference for a lot of people. Similar to how the Occupy Wall Street movement transformed into a disaster relief effort after Hurricane Sandy, the seeds for the center that Giovanni co-founded were also planted by a grassroots social movement. What began with community kitchens for low-income students at the University of Puerto Rico quickly gained momentum with the historic strikes that took place in the spring of 2017, where thousands of university students gathered to resist massive budget cuts to the school system. When Maria hit the island, that network of activists and organizers didn't waste any time. They knew they had to do something to help. So in Kawas, they began cooking food. Lots of it. Yeah, we were serving 300, 400, 500 that first week of people in lunch, and sometimes 200 or close to 300 at breakfast. But they also had a larger vision. Instead of calling it just the community kitchen of Kawa, we tried to put a bigger name because we have an idea of building a center that could be more than just food. We know that after the hurricane, food was a strong necessity, but after a couple of weeks or maybe a month or two, other necessities like health issues arose and people have like living issues and medical issues and other issues are were not related, necessarily directly related to Maria, but they were there before Maria. The larger vision that Giovanni and his fellow activists had was to create permanent projects that would go beyond basic disaster relief, a way of addressing some of the more chronic challenges people were facing on the island. So that's how we came with the idea of launching a, a community space called Mutual Aid Center. We did it here in Caguas, but also we were able to discuss the idea with other activists who were already doing things. And through that discussion, we came with the idea of doing the same thing in different places. So can, we can create a network 
to make the idea of the mutual aid more stronger in the island. So it's probably a good time to unpack things a little bit. What exactly are all those chronic struggles that exist in Puerto Rico? Where to begin? If Puerto Rico was a state, it would be the poorest state in the U.S. 40% of the island lives below the U.S. poverty line. And maybe you're thinking, it's probably relatively cheaper to live in Puerto Rico. Not really. The cost of living in San Juan, the capital, is higher than it is in the average U.S. metropolitan area. Then there's the fact that one in 10 Puerto Ricans are unemployed. And of course, there's the debt. Puerto Rico has been struggling with a potentially illegitimate debt that has crippled the country's public services. For example, between 2010 and 2017, 340 schools were shut down. On top of that, pensions are being cut, healthcare services are being cut, the island is in bad shape. So when Maria hit, it didn't just tear the roofs off of buildings, it tore the lid off of an ongoing disaster. It woke people up. And Giovanni, like many other activists on the island, saw it as an opportunity, a chance to intervene. We see our project as a political project. We want Puerto Rico to be different. We want society to transform in some way. Uh, that means to transform values, the way people relate, the way people trust each other, the way people see communities. So we see this space as a, as a way of organizing people to gaining those values, to gain that experience. In a long-term vision, we want Puerto Rico full of mutual aid centers. We want to develop the concept of popular power, which is not a concept developed here in any way yet. Me llamo Astrid Cruz Negrón. Soy maestra de escuela secundaria. Soy maestra de español y de historia. Y soy maestra miembro de la Federación de Maestros de Puerto Rico. O sea que soy maestra activa sindicalmente eh, y activista. He estado de lleno inmersa en luchas políticas, sociales, ambientales en Utuado desde que tengo uso de razón. We're now in Utuado, all the way on the other side of the island in the Central Mountain Range. El pueblo de Utuado fue de los más afectados durante, por el paso del huracán. Y tener tanta agua hace que los efectos fueran más visibles para la población. Yo creo que es el pueblo de Puerto Rico con más acuíferos, con más agua. Y las inundaciones fueron bien grandes. Pero el aspecto social es, es, es esencial eh, mirarlo. Y es que Utuado es un pueblo abandonado por las autoridades estatales y federales hace mucho. Eh, La pobreza en Utuado es altísima, el desempleo es altísimo, el primer empleador en Utuado es el mismo, el propio gobierno eh, municipal y, la, y el departamento de educación, las escuelas. But schools in Utuado are starting to disappear, just like on the rest of the island. Because of budget cuts, a quarter of schools in Puerto Rico are shutting down, displacing tens of thousands of students and their teachers. Three schools in Utuado were closed just this year. Y la escuela no es solo escuela, es centro de apoyo, en el huracán fue refugio, es centro social, es la biblioteca del barrio donde único hay, donde único hay un trabajador social en el barrio de esa escuela. La escuela tiene un rol tan esencial. Entonces, no podemos decir que las autoridades estatales abandonaron Utuado por el huracán, lo tenían abandonado desde mucho antes. Y las autoridades federales igual. Actually, after the hurricane, the federal government did show up in Utuado. But it wasn't exactly the way that Astrid had hoped for. Y sin embargo, durante el huracán, las filas en las gasolineras y en los supermercados después que abrieron, sí estaban controladas por la Guardia Nacional y entraba y daba la orden de cerrar un supermercado. Venía un camión lleno de agua para los comercios y lo incautaban. La Guardia Nacional incautaba el agua de los comercios. Que si tú pudieras pensar que el Estado incauta bienes esenciales para repartirlo al pueblo, pues tiene un sentido, pero no era así. It was in the midst of all this when Astrid and many others came to realize that if they were going to survive, they were going to have to do it on their own. So she started meeting with other members of her community, thinking about ways to move forward. La respuesta natural de cada uno fue buscar qué hago fuera del asistencialismo y fuera de las respuestas hegemónicas de los gobiernos y de las instituciones que, que lo que quieren es 
perpetuar la situación que había antes del huracán. Uno como activista por un mundo mejor, pues uno busca que esta vez no solo resolvamos la emergencia, sino que cada paso que demos sea encaminado a construir ese mundo que, por el cual siempre uno ha estado trabajando. The Mutual Aid Center of Utuado emerged somewhat spontaneously out of this shared vision for a better Puerto Rico. For a while, they didn't even have a physical space to call their own, and they were just working off the cuff, trying to get donated supplies out as fast as possible, and putting on activities in public squares, community centers, and schools. One of their more recent events was the Disaster Preparation Fair, with the focus on community education teaching people skills like rainwater collection and map reading, for example. Maria isn't the only hurricane that's hit Puerto Rico, and it won't be the last. The reality of stronger and more frequent storms fueled by climate change makes this kind of preparedness incredibly important. But the activists and organizers here also always have an eye on the broader vision. El Centro de Apoyo Mutuo, ciertamente que no queremos quedarnos en la situación de emergencia, de sobrevivir María que queremos que todo lo que hacemos sea en pos de construir un mundo nuevo, una sociedad nueva en la que creemos más justa, más igualitaria, eh, y de empoderar la gente, de construir poder popular y que la gente eh, reciba más destreza de educación y de preparación y resistencia para ellos poder estar en una mejor condición de construir y proponer. They also put on musical performances and plays. Maria pasa y dice, Puerto Rico se levanta, vamos a ver. Maria pasa y dice, Puerto Rico se levanta, vamos a ver. Vamos a ver. We're just outside the home of Ramanita Bonilla, in the mountain town of Las Marias. A group of volunteers are installing cisterns to catch rainwater. It's part of an ongoing program put together by the Mutual Aid Center of Las Marias. Y son tremendo, son tremendo poniendo las cisternas ahí y trabajando ahí porque se lleva muy bien. Perched atop the Central Mountain Range, Las Marias is very difficult to access. There are steep mountain roads and frequent mudslides, making this area especially vulnerable to extreme weather. And Maria left it devastated. Residents were cut off from food, water, and electricity for weeks. Word spread around the island that Las Marias was in trouble, and volunteers came from all around to help including a group all the way from San Juan, which is on the opposite side of the island. Pasamos los días, eh, seguro, estuvimos sin agua mundo y tiempo aquí. Y, y, y entonces nos trajeron agua. La gente era bien, bien buena, porque nos mandaron gente a, 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 a traernos agua y comida y de todo. Nos trajeron este, ajo, habichuela, de todo nos trajeron. Pero si no hubiera sido por ellos, no hubiéramos comido. Nosotros hubiéramos muerto, sí. Y los muchos que murieron fue de eso mismo. One group of volunteers ended up staying long term. They founded the town's mutual aid center, and two of them, Jose and Omar, are organizing today's event. My name's Jose Bella Flores. Um, I'm known as Guri. I'm from the city, from Rio Piedras. And I moved here after the Hurricane Maria Hubo Carabones in Las Marias to help out with the community and, and start building from the bottom up a center where we could have cultural development and different types of opportunities for the community and, and us. Before Maria hit, Jose was working three jobs in and around San Juan. He decided to give it all up to answer the call for help. Once the hurricane passed, I don't know what was it that my heart was beating fast every day, every hour, when I went to sleep, just thinking that it's the time. Something was telling me that I, I needed to, to make a decision and just focus on the opportunity that we have right now 
you know, other than Maria and the tragedy, the austerity measures that have been taken on our country, well, I don't know. I felt I felt a drive, and I and I just said, let's sacrifice this and let's see if I put my strength, my focus, and all my energies on just organizing with 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 the people. I think maybe I could kick off something that might become something bigger than what we've been imagining. In the year following the hurricane, he saw that bigger vision take form in Las Marias, as community members became more and more involved. It's very empowering and to see people that maybe weren't so active, being active here in the center, being active as a community leader. For me, it's beautiful and, it's, and I couldn't be happier to see that. And here's Omar Reyes. He also came all the way from San Juan in those first days and helped found the Mutual Aid Center here in Las Marias. We have a better hope now. We still have hope. We had hope before and we will have hope always, but now it's better hope. It's a hope more clearly of our own. It's our own option. It's not the option that someone comes and just tell you that that's your option. No, we are creating our own possibility and our own reality. There are now mutual aid centers all over the islands. But as their numbers continue to grow, so does the threat of increased austerity and state negligence. In a chilling report released by FEMA in 2018, the agency acknowledged its poor response to Maria and essentially told Puerto Ricans to expect something similar during future hurricane seasons. Now the government too here in Puerto Rico is selling the idea that people should do more self-management, which is not the same idea that we are talking. But self-management in the idea of the government is that you take care of yourself. And the truth is, the government has been very active, though not always in the most constructive of ways. While Ricardo Rosselló was the governor of Puerto Rico, he traveled around the U.S., promising to open the island up to foreign investors and selling off public infrastructure to the highest bidder. With this growing pursuit of disaster capitalism and after decades of neglect, it's no wonder that many Puerto Ricans have little confidence that the administration will help them. In the summer of 2019, this little confidence transcended to massive protests, calling for the resignation of Rosselló after a chat conversation with his executive team was leaked to the public. The chat contained jokes about Hurricane Maria's deaths, attacks on politicians and dissident voices, and recurrent misogynist and homophobic language, which the governor himself promoted. The conversation also exposed ethical misbehavior and conflict of interest within his administration. After two weeks of protests and a growing disapproval from the international community, the governor was forced to announce his resignation on the night of July 24th. A pesar de contar con el mandato del pueblo que democráticamente me eligió, hoy siento que continuar en esta posición representa una dificultad para que el éxito alcanzado perdure. We don't want the help of the state right now. We want to build a project that, that can prove that we can do it without them and then compete with them in the future because they have the resources that we should have. We are trying to build political power and social fabric, so it makes sense to fight against the state. It makes sense because we have an opportunity. Right now, we don't have any opportunity against the state. You know, we, <laughs> you're going to take time. Mariana has been an example of a community that refuses to believe that we don't have power. This is Christine Nieves. She helped found the Mutual Aid Center in Mariana in the municipality of Umacao, just off the eastern coast of the island. She had visited the Mutual Aid Center in Kawas in the week after Maria hit, and she immediately knew that she wanted to do something similar. What I saw there just blew me away because I saw people that were together, I saw people that were smiling and happy, and there was color, and there were artists playing guitars, and there were signs with beautiful, bright drawings, and I just took out my notebook and took out my camera and I started documenting everything that I saw. Christine decided that she was going to take a risk. She and her partner Luis quit their jobs and founded what's now the Mutual Aid Project of Mariana. 
Now we are being proactive about creating different economic models that create wealth for people in Mariana with people in Mariana in mind and in engagement, co-designing it. And everything that has been happening in, in the organizing has started from a place of dignity and saying, we know our rights, we know what we deserve, and we're going to organize and we're going to demand it, and we're not going to wait. And if we have to start making it ourselves, we're going to do it. So now what we're presenting is an actual example of how government must evolve in the presence of self-governed communities. What we're doing is actually the government's job. And this is going to present something that's at some point going to have to be dealt with because we're building power. And when people are free and people are awake and people know what they're worth, then they're not being manipulated anymore. And that's our goal. And I firmly believe that the more of these communities that happen in Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico will change because it's just a reflection of a different country. And so if we start from the individual, the whole community changes. And so that's where we have to begin. As we face the reality of an increasingly chaotic climate, we must examine the situation through a social, economic, and political lens. Without intervention, the contours of a disaster's impact and recovery will inevitably exacerbate existing inequalities. Maybe the best technology we can deploy in the wake of a disaster might just be a kind of social technology. Closely knit, organized, and empowered communities that are more resilient during catastrophes and are better able to demand the resources they need to not only survive those acute disasters, but to rebuild on a more just and sustainable basis. Perhaps these disastrous events can open up a space that is normally closed off, a gap in which we can begin reclaiming community agency and power, an opportunity to tell a different story about who we are and what gives our lives meaning and purpose. Vamos a ver. 